you love Jesus today? Man, I love Jesus too. If you would turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 17, that's where we're going to be today. You see up here, uh, I entitled this sermon, Consider the Source. It's kind of a play on words. You ever hear somebody say, well, you got got to consider the source. (laughs) You got to consider the source. You know, as you you turn on your news, you got to consider the source, whether you're watching Fox or CNN or MSNBC or what, you got to consider the source. You know, that sounds like a really negative use of that statement, you know, uh, in our culture of fake news and our culture of Russian involvement in elections and everything else. In in our culture where people talk about other people, you got to consider the source. But today I'm going to take a little bit more of a positive spin on it in light of Thanksgiving being just Thursday. I want us to consider our source, Jesus Christ. You know, folks, we live in a nation that uh, should be the most grateful nation on the face of the earth. We really do. But, but really, folks, you know that, that our nation, can I just say this? I'm already off my, my notes. In our country, if we go into a financial recession, we call it a depression. Because all of our happiness is so tightly knit together with our finances and, and our stuff here in America. We are the most blessed nation on the face of the earth. Amen. And yet, it is our nation that's full of opioid addictions and, and all kinds of medications try to help us get past all of our emotional problems. Folks, I don't want to put you down. If you're dealing with that stuff, that's fine. But, but most of it, I mean, we'll pray for you, but most of this stuff is because we're just wrapped up in ourselves and we don't know how to be thankful for anything. We live in this nation where we have forgotten what it is that we were founded by. So we forget who it was that founded the United States of America. And I'm not just talking about people. This nation was established by godly men and women, imperfect, but were pursuing God with their lives and established this nation under the, all, the hand of Almighty God. That's just who we are. And so as we look at this today, I want us to consider our source. Yes, I realize Thanksgiving was the other day and we ought to get into the Christmas season, Pastor, and talk about Christmas. But I, I'll just remind you, last week, Pastor Mark was here so I couldn't do my Thanksgiving message. <laughs> In all things, folks, if we're going to live out a life of joy, if we're going to live out a life of peace, if we're going to live out a life of thankfulness, we have to know who we are thankful to as well as what we are thankful for. We have to consider the source. We have got to consider the source of all things in our lives. You say, Pastor, what are you talking about? Listen, everything in your life is a gift from God. Every good thing in your life is a gift from God. They flow down from the Father of heavenly lights. We see that in the book of James, that every good and precious gift, it flows down from heaven. We live here in America of this place of self-promotion where it says, well, see, I worked really hard, and and so because of my work, I did this. who, Who put breath in your lungs? Who gave you a mind to think and to have knowledge and to have skills and talents and abilities? Who was it that let you put your feet on the floor and your legs to work in the morning and get you up to go to work? It's God and His graciousness, His his faithfulness and His mercy. Listen, folks, all of these things, it's good. It's cooperative. Do what you got to do. If God gave you a mind to think and He gave you hands to work and He gave you a body that will get up in the morning and do something, then bless God, He intended for you to do something. Right? But when you get your paycheck at the end of the week, don't say, look how good I did. Go, thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you. Because He is the source of every good thing. It doesn't matter what it is, whether it's a job, whether it's a friend. How many of us know that good, close friends, people you can trust and can count on, are a gift from God? Friends that aren't going to stab you in the back. Friends that aren't going to talk bad about you. Friends that aren't going to say things about you. Friends that aren't going to turn on you. Folks, listen, it is a gift from God. We don't have to be friends with everybody. We don't have to have be the most popular person in the world. But wow, what a gift to have one or two really close friends. It's a gift. But yet, you were cooperative. You were nice. You were faithful. You got along. You did what you had to do. But ultimately, wow, thank you, God, for bringing this person across my path. Every good thing in your life is a source from God. Jesus Christ is the giver of all good things. So today, I want to consider the source and be grateful to Him. Look at Luke chapter 17 with me. Jesus is on His way and doing some ministry and he's passing through the outer parts of the city, uh, cities between Samaria and Galilee. 
Verse 11 says this, Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And as he was going into a village, ten men had leprosy, who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance. I'm just going to stop for a second. This isn't in my notes either. But wow, what a wonderful thing to be on a journey and minister along the way. As we're headed into the holiday season, and, and a lot of folks are probably still traveling right now from Thanksgiving. Uh, many of us are going to be going to all kinds of functions and traveling over the next month, seeing family. Excuse me. What an awesome thing that as we travel that we can minister to others. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? We're not, where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except for this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. So I look at this this morning, I, I kind of evaluate in my mind these ten men. And number one, I see ten men that are all different, yet defined by the same condition. Ten individual men that are all defined by the same condition, yet different. What a picture of our culture. People from all walks of life, people from all different backgrounds. How many of us know that sickness and disease isn't necessarily selective? Contagions don't really care what, what, uh, whether you're wealthy or poor. They don't care. Things that are contagious, they'll latch on to you. This very contagious disease, leprosy, had latched on to these ten men, and they were all different, but they were all defined by the same thing. They were seen as leprous. They were recognized for it. They were isolated because of it. They were rejected in their culture because of it. In this group was probably men from all ages, men from all backgrounds, probably men that maybe had been married at one time, men that maybe had children at another time, others that never had the opportunity. Maybe leprosy hit them at an early age. Maybe leprosy hit them late in age. We don't know these things. But what we do know is that they were ten men, and the only thing that they had in common was that they were outsiders. They were refugees of sorts because of their disease. Their disease had put them outside of the city. Jesus, uh, as he walked along, was outside of the city when he ministered to them because that's where they lived together. These people were different, yet the same. They had dis distanced themselves because of their disease. Distanced themselves from their families, from the crowd, and even Jesus. <laughs> Never mind, just look at them. There's nothing happening. <laughs> Secondly, we see that these men were ten men of hope. Here they were in their moment of disease, in their moment of separation, in their time of being distanced from the crowd and distanced from their families and their homes, yet somehow something happened where these ten men became men of hope. I don't know what it was. I don't know if somebody had told them that Jesus was coming. I don't know if they had heard that Jesus was not a respecter of persons. If you were sick, He would heal you. He'd lay hands on you. He would forgive you. He would do all these different things. I don't know what happened, but the Word got out. You know what needs to happen in our culture is that people that are diseased with sin need to get the Word out and the Word heard to them that Jesus Christ is still the forgiver of sins and the restorer of lives. But these people... These people, these men, something had happened. They'd heard. And they not only heard who he was, but they had heard that he was coming their direction. And that which was once hopeless now became hope-filled. That which was once an outcast, those which were once separated, now had an opportunity of hope to say, maybe if he can hear me, maybe he'll hear me, maybe he'll turn. So they turned and they spoke loudly out to him. Can I stop for just a second? Don't let this loudly reference define true, effective prayer. There are some people who will tell you, unless it's loud, it's not spiritual. If it's not loud, it's not spiritual. And so in ministry, there's a tendency for ministers to want to get a reaction out of people 
And the only time they want a reaction is to make themselves feel better because this is what some of you look like. So they want to get this reaction. So what they'll do is say, come on now. The Lord wants you to give a praise out to God right now. Come on now. Lift your voice. A bigger praise than that. He deserves more than that. He's a great God. He's a... And so they do all this until you get really loud. And then everybody's like, now that was effective. <laughs> well, listen, folks, I don't have a problem with a loud praise, man. Let it, I'll stand over here and scream during worship. <laughs> I don't care, but, but the reality of it is this. Just because they're loud, it doesn't mean that their prayer was more effective. It just means they had to yell because they couldn't get close to Jesus. Amen? Do you remember the lady, the woman with the issue of blood? She didn't yell and scream on her way to Jesus, did she? She just went. Jesus said, I felt virtue go out of me. Wasn't a word spoken. So don't ever let somebody tell you you have to be loud to pray effectively. It's nonsense. But if you feel loud... Be loud. I don't care. Amen? These people, these men, became united in hope, in desperation, and cried out to God with one voice. Their hope was that Jesus, as he passed by, might hear them, that he might understand, and that he might show compassion on them. Thirdly, I see that these were ten men of active faith. Now, as Jesus heard them, and he's passing by, and they yell, he hears them, and they look, and they say, Lord, you know, have mercy on us. Master, have mercy and pity on me. Jesus looks at him, and he, this is all Jesus says. He says, go, show yourself to the priest. And they went. I don't know about you, but that's an act of faith to me. Now, we could dive into all the, uh, the Jewish customs and what was expected. In order for somebody to truly be cleansed from leprosy, they had to go present themselves to the priest. The priest had a process they had to go through. They had to come back and be checked. And it took some time for them to be decreed as clean and no longer leprous. Even in the Old Testament, there was, there was, uh, there was room made for healing. You know God is a healing God, same yesterday, today, and forever? The Old Testament, God healed too. Cool. Cool. So these people were told, they said, you're going to have to go show yourself the priest. So they looked at, they said, okay, let's go. Folks, listen, that's an act of faith as far as I'm concerned. Because here's what they didn't do. They didn't stand there and say, I will not leave until you heal me. They didn't stand there and say, no, Jesus, you just, no, heal me first and then I'll go. They didn't argue. They just obeyed. And so they stopped and they said, well, Let's obey, let's leave, let's go our own way, let's do our own thing. And for me, I don't know about you, but for me, I think it would be hard to stand there and hope for healing and only hear the words, go, go away, show yourself to the priest. First of all, you would think as they left, I can't really go show myself to the priest because I have leprosy. Right? They weren't healed instantly. It was on the way that they were healed. So they had to leave in faith that before they got to the priest, they could approach him. Faith. You know, Peter, Peter stepped out of the boat in faith to go see Jesus, and he kept his eyes on him the whole time, walking on the water. These people had to take their eyes off of him and have faith. That's tough. But they did it, and they obeyed. And this, not only were they ten men that, that had faith, but then we see that they were ten men that were healed. Jesus said that they were all cleansed, all of them. And it happened when they were on their way. Can you imagine? I want to be a part of that conversation. Does anybody know what leprosy is? Folks, it's not just eczema. We're not just talking about a rash here. We're talking about giant boil-looking things all over you. We're talking about deformed faces, things that steal sight, things that steal speech. We're talking about things that will cause, as it grows, possibly to, to have your limbs literally fall off, fingers and arms and toes and feet. We're talking about people that probably maybe drug a foot or limped or had a hard time walking because of this disease. We're dealing with people here that were visibly seen and going, wow. 
They would say, I'm unclean, I have leprosy, and stay back. People were like, I know. I can see it. We're talking about guys that were visibly and physically changed. And in some cases, looked barely human. Leprosy is an awful thing. Horrible thing. So here's these men in this condition, possibly having trouble maybe limping, walking, possibly having lost limbs, I don't know, possibly a little bit blinded because of their face and how things have grown on them, trying to get their way to the priest. And along the way, Along the way, the conversation, as they're walking, the one maybe that's dragging his leg, suddenly kind of goes. And he looks at his hand, and his hand that was deformed, and the boils all over him, he begins to straighten things out. Maybe fingers that had fallen off grew back. Individuals, their faces begin, the, the pockets of just of, of masses on their faces just begin to reduce, and they look at each other, and before their very eyes, their skin goes normal. Oh, I would love to have seen that. I would have loved to have seen these people's faces. I would have loved to have seen these men's reactions. I would have loved to have heard their conversation on, along the way as their lives were given back to them. These were men that had faith. These were men that were healed. And then they were men that were divided. You know what blows my mind? And I've seen this happen many times. I've seen churches go through a period of revival only to be divided afterwards. Never understood that. I, folks, and, and listen, can I just take a moment as your pastor to teach you for just a second? First Assembly, we always talk about revival. I want to warn you. If you see revival happen, you best get your head in the book. You best get your head in prayer. You better get your heart right with God because as soon as we're on the other side of it, the enemy's going to use you to try to divide and mess people up. Happens all the time. I got a phone call from Caitlin Mannion. She's asked for our prayers. I, I had a message from Caitlin. She's ministering there in Peru and uh, one of our girls from here ministering in Peru. And she says to me, Long messages here a few weeks ago tell, tell me about revival. Man, it's breaking out. It's happening. This is awesome. Kids getting saved. Kids giving their lives to Christ. Families being transformed. Power of God moving. Two weeks later, um, can we talk? Can we Skype? I need some godly wisdom on how to handle some things. <laughs> Isn't it weird how when God does a great work, the enemy works just right alongside of him trying to divide, separate, and cause issues? These individuals, and I don't want to talk them down, but they were divided. I don't want to stand up here. I've heard preachers do this against the other nine and say the other nine were just ungrateful, wrong, and all this other stuff. I don't think that's the teaching here. Listen, the nine, they followed their path. Nine of them were healed on their way to the priest, and for whatever reason, they said, I'm going to continue. Folks, that's not a bad thing. They're in obedience to Jesus, right? Didn't Jesus say, go show yourself to the priest? And they probably thought to themselves, I'm going to go show myself to the priest. I'm not officially clean until that guy tells me I'm clean. I can't go home and see my family until I go through the process. Let's keep going. So I don't want to put them down. I don't want to put them in a negative light. They threw themselves into the system. This is how it's done. This is what we have to do. And it wasn't totally evil. They were obeying the Lord in those things. But one said, you know what? <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I have to go back. I got to go back. The one said, I've not put my hope in a priest. I've put my hope in the Lord. I know the source from which it came. I know who the source is. The source told me to go and that I would be healed on the way and I went and I've been healed. I want to go back and I want to show him and I want to say thank you. You see, he wanted to go to the source. He wanted to go to the one that had spoken. He, had, he wanted to go to the one whose power had set him free. And before he met Jesus, he had been condemned, he had been separated, he had been rejected, he was hopeless. Why wouldn't he say thank you? 
I'm assuming he thought to himself, if I go to the priest now, I may never see him again. I want to go. You want to know what I think? (laughs) Why he really wanted to do it that moment? Because he could. He was clean. Whether a priest said anything or not, he knew something had happened. He looked different. And he thought to himself, I can get through the crowds now to Jesus without people screaming, without causing a ruckus. They don't even recognize me anymore as having been that leprous person. They don't even know who I am. I look different. Before he had to stand off and cry for mercy. And now he can run and he can throw himself at the feet of Jesus and say thank you. Once he was far off, but now he has been brought near. Paul says, once you were not a people and now you are a people. This scripture, this understanding right here is the transformation that takes place in our lives. We are like the healed leper. We can now approach Christ. We no longer have to stay at a distance yelling, but we can approach Him. Too often people are cleansed and they fall into a religious routine. They come to church. They go out of church. They come to church. They go out of church. And they think, like the other nine, that going through the process is what I have to do. But folks, somewhere in there, you've got to come to a place where you're able to throw yourself at the feet of Jesus and say, Father, thank you. At some point, you don't have to care who's looking. I used to. I didn't care when I stood afar off. And now I'm not going to care now that I'm near. Even if nobody else is throwing themselves at his feet, I will. I don't care. There was a time in my sin I didn't care what I did. But now in my salvation, I don't care what I do in front of you for the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. So what? See me as a fool. I really don't care. I'm so thankful. You don't know what I've been saved from. You you, you haven't lived my life. You haven't been in here, and some of you don't want to be. (laughs) You don't know what was in here. You don't know what these have done. You don't know what this has said. You don't understand this life that I've lived. No, it's not the worst. No, it's not the best. Somewhere in the middle, but I can tell you, I know who I am apart from Christ. This individual said, I can draw near to him. I'm going to do it. Folks, my whole point of this today is this. We've got to understand the source of every good thing in our life, and we must not let anything hinder us from returning to him regularly, throwing ourselves at his feet and saying, thank you. Instead of exalting ourselves and saying, look what I've done. Look what I can do. Look what I've done with my life. Instead of putting others down and all of these other things, we must find a place of true praise. And true praise overflows out of a heart of thankfulness. You want to see a person's heart? Measure it by what they praise. People will praise people. People will praise themselves. People will curse people. People will curse things. They'll exalt other things, all kinds of stuff. And on this day, the overwhelming majority did not return grateful, not saying that they weren't grateful at all. They just didn't return to the source. They put themselves into the system of cleanliness. They were trapped inside of that ideology for some reason. But now there's one, this one that Jesus says was a foreigner, and the foreigner returned and gave thanks to him. You say, why is that key? Why is it so key that Jesus would say this foreigner? See, Jesus wasn't a racist, folks. But there were a lot of them around him that were. There were a lot of them around him that didn't like that Samaritan man. And he said, look, this Samaritan, why is he the only one that returned to give praise to God? Weren't all ten cleansed? See, Jesus was showing the goodness in a man that they had written off. You say, what's the point? What's the significance of him being a Samaritan? Think of it this way. This man was not only an outcast because of his leprosy, but he was was an outcast because of his genealogy. He was not a man of the promise. Most likely intermingled Gentile and Jew and people, they didn't like him. He was an outcast just because of the family he was born into. And now this Jewish Messiah took a moment to hear him, took a moment to speak to him, took a moment to heal him, of course he's going to return grateful. (laughs) That doesn't happen. 
Jews don't speak with Samaritans. Jews don't deal with Samaritans. Jews, you realize what a long shot it was when he threw himself into that crowd of ten, probably hoping himself to, bl to blend in with the others that were known Jews so that maybe he might catch the attention of the Jewish Messiah, Jesus. And what happened was, as he heard him, healed him, and so of course he's going to return. Listen, folks, have you ever been through anything in your life? <laughs> Has God ever been good to you in anything? Surely there's a praise of thanks somewhere in there. You know? Surely there is. Those who realize what God has done for them cannot remain silent. And all through Scripture, we see these people. We see Miriam, after they cross the Red Sea, sing a, a long praise to God. We see Hannah, who hadn't had children, was barren, but yet God gave her children. Even though uh, wicked Eli, the priest, turned on her and called her drunk and everything else because she was calling out to God and sobbing before him, God gave her a son, and she praised God for him. David gave thanks to God after winning his battle against the Philistines, gave that praise to him. Many times David gave praise to God. King Solomon thanked God for all that he had done to provide for Israel in the prayer of dedication at the temple. Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, the beginning of the Christmas account. A lot of people don't talk about that, but it is. John the Baptist, mama, when she found out she was pregnant, praised God because she had been barren. Mary had a beautiful song of praise thanking God for, for being chosen to bear the incarnate Son of God. Folks, listen, it's a natural reaction for people of God to be grateful to God and to sing praise to God. It must overflow out of our hearts. It must be implanted in us thankfulness. The Bible says we are a peculiar people. One of the things that makes us peculiar is the fact that we will not exalt ourselves. A true born-again believer of God, full of the Spirit of God, is not going to promote themselves. They're not going to be a self-promoter. They'll turn all praise to God. doesn't matter what they do. They can have a healing ministry. See thousands healed. Oh, hallelujah. And people say, you're great. You're awesome. No, all glory to God. I'm just a vessel. I'm not doing anything. It's all God. That's peculiar. Isn't that peculiar in our culture today? Because anybody does anything in our culture, they got to they tweet about it. They got to put it on social media. We got to call our friends. Oh, that's what I did. And you know they did because, because the conversation, so how are you doing today? You know what I did today? <laughs> well, I'm doing, what? Oh, okay. What would you do? Oh, okay. Okay. Monday mornings, preachers are on Facebook. God saved this many today and these many healed. And oh. Sometimes I want to say, you are God. Let's keep giving God the praise, amen? Peculiar. That's peculiar to give God glory and praise. It's not natural. James 5 talks about praying for healing and forgiveness and everything else, but it also says that people that are happy allow their prayers to overflow into psalms of praise. So if God is blessing you, there's got to be something there. The Spirit is within us, and Jesus Himself set a procedure of praise and thanks to the Father in His life for us to follow. He gave thanks for the elements of communion. He gave thanks for what they meant. He gave thanks that this was His blood, the new covenant for the remission of their sins. In all of these things, He gave thanks, and then He gave them out. We also saw uh, where He thanked God outside of Lazarus' tomb. He thanked the Father two different times as He as he fed the multitudes, Jesus was a God. He was God in flesh and thankful. He's the source, but he's thankful? Yeah. So if Jesus is thankful, don't you think we ought to be thankful too? You see, thank, thanklessness is a condition of a godless culture. In 2 Timothy 3, I know we're very familiar with this passage. But, but beginning in verse 1, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. Everybody say terrible. terrible. Actually, say it like this, terrible. terrible. It's just terrible. terrible. Terrible times. And what are the defining factors of terrible times? People will be lovers of themselves. Do we have that today? Yep. Lovers of money. <laughs> Do we? Um, just kidding. Boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents ungrateful ungrateful 
Unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. What Paul was telling young Timothy is, is young Timothy, in your leadership, there are people that are going to be in the church, they're going to have a form of godliness, they're going to have a form of religion, but they're not going to have the power to set them free. It's not going to control their lives, they're not going to base their lives on it. They're going to be reactive like animals to their flesh. And these are the things that are going to be evident in their lives. And one of them is, they're going to be ungrateful. Ungratefulness is a product of the flesh and not of the spirit, folks. Do you realize ungrateful people are very damaging, not only to themselves, but to those who connect themselves to them? I'll let that soak in for a second. Paul told young Timothy, don't connect yourself with an ungrateful person. I was taught to say thank you for everything. <laughs> In our house, if you got a Christmas gift, my wife was really good at this. Um, the kids would open a gift and she'd say, what do you say? Thank you? You bet. Thank you. You know, we go to grandma's house, go to grandma's, all the grandma's. There was a time we're going to three grandma's houses and the kids are getting gifts. And after a while, they're just like, Shah! I mean, they get gifts at home. They go to grandma's, they go to grandma's, go to grandma's. And after a while, you're like... Lord, where are we going to put all this stuff? But after a while, they, they get this entitled mentality that says, I want it all. It's all mine. It's all mine. And then you, after a while, you're like, you better say thank you. I'm going to bust you upside the head. <laughs> Parents, have you ever been there before? You're going to say thank you. If you don't say thank you, I'm going to beat some thankfulness into you here in a minute. <laughs> you know, gratefulness is important. I was taught to say thank you about everything. I don't care who it is. If, I, if it, somebody holds the door for me, thank you. If somebody's at Walmart and they pull a car out and hand it to you, I say thank you. You walk past somebody, they say hi to you or, or hand you a paper about something, I say thank you. doesn't matter. Even if there's something, you know, they're saying, would you like to donate to this? You know what I say? I say no thank you. Why? Because that's, that's called respect. It's called honor. And that's just natural, folks. The people of God, that should be embedded in us in all things toward Him, overflowing out of our lives toward people. Amen. You ever thank somebody for their negative opinion about something? Thank you for that. I appreciate you bringing that to my attention. We need to be grateful. I always said that the, optimist needs, uh, the opti optimist needs the pessimist because if we didn't have the pessimist, the optimist would go nuts. <laughs> Thank you, pessimists. But I will say this. Churches are being destroyed by, by ungrateful people all over America. Churches are destroyed by ungrateful people. People who, who they cannot be grateful about anything connected with the church that they've connected themselves with. The issue is not the church. The issue, uh, child of God, is you. If, if you're not grateful about anything about this place, chances are there's probably a lot in your life that you're not grateful about. And that's a root of bitterness that God wants to pull out of your life. I'm not saying I'm perfect or the church is perfect, but good grief, if you can't find anything to be grateful about with your church, then there's a problem. It's terrible. I can tell you that. Churches, seriously, churches are divided because people are ungrateful. They're not grateful for their friends. They're not grateful for the ones they worship with. They're not grateful for their leadership. They're not grateful for songs. They're not grateful for people trying. They're not grateful for anything. All they can do is complain, tear down, uh, and, and disregard, and suggest, and, and mimic, and make fun of. And folks, I'm telling you, it will destroy you, and it will destroy anybody that connects themselves to you. Let's let it overflow out of our lives, an attitude of saying, I know where I've come from. Don't let religious expectations and cultural pressure silence your praise. Speaking of the woman who anointed Jesus, Jesus said this about her in Luke 7, verse 47. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much, but he who has been forgiven little loves little. You know, folks, we have to stop and remember where we've come from. We've got to remember what God has forgiven us of. I remember years ago, I put my testimony on, on social media, and, and, and I just shared it in a paragraph form, and part of that that was in there described me and my sinful condition. And that I, was, that I regretted and hated who I was and my sin and the things of my past. And you know that people couldn't handle it. Oh, 
but, but Bob, you were always such a nice person. I hate it that you said that you were awful. You weren't an awful person. Listen, I don't, I'm not trying to be encouraged. I got all the encouragement I need from the one that saved me and set me free. I don't need you. Listen, it's okay. Folks, we've got to come in the reality of understanding who we are apart from Christ and in our sinful condition before we can ever be thankful for what He set us free from. Those who have been forgiven much, love much, folks, listen, we've got to understand that this is who God is, what God has done in us. Not to make us self-elevated, ungrateful for every little thing in our lives, but to live a life of gratefulness because of what God has done. This lady knew what he had done in her life, and she broke protocol. She said, I don't care, I'm going to do something crazy. I'm about to do something crazy. So she goes in, she anoints Jesus in the middle of all this room. The disciples are like, how dare her, that money could have been used to feed the poor if we could have sold it. And I'm sure that's exactly what Judas sounded like. (laughs) Judas was an old British guy. Oh, I believe that we could have taken the money and used it to feed the poor. You know, I mean, I don't know, but. (laughs) And Jesus corrected him, right? Just so you know, bloody is not a cuss word in America. But I just realized that I did it, and I think over there it's a cuss word. Forgive me, Lord. But this, <laughs> the, the reality of it is this, that there was much this lady had been forgiven. She said, I don't care. I'll go crazy. I'll give him everything I have. What's the most expensive thing I can give? She didn't care. She didn't care that she was going to be ridiculed about it. She broke protocol, folks. It's okay to break protocol sometimes. It's okay to allow our praise to go beyond what's expected, the the pressure of the culture. David broke protocol. He was so excited that they were bringing the Ark of the Covenant back in to the the city and and celebrating. He goes, he's dancing. Or was it like this? I don't know. But I can tell you, I can tell you this, it broke protocol. He wasn't dignified. How dare you, preacher? He didn't care. He said, said, you know what? Ridicule me all you want to. I will become even more undignified than this. Why? Because David knew this was the same God that pulled me out of the backside of the desert from watching sheep and put me into the, 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 the throne room as king. This is the same God that delivered me from a lion and a bear. It's the same God that empowered me to kill a giant. The same God that's used me to overcome the enemies of God. This is the same God that's given me everything in my life. I will dance before Him. I'll break protocol if I have to, but I'm going to live grateful. Children broke protocol in the Word of God. They would, they would cry out to Jesus and praise Him. You remember that? They said, shut these kids up. Jesus said, out of the mouths of babes you have ordained praise. You know what that means? Ordained praise? That means God appointed, God anointed praise. In other words, God led by the Spirit. Those babies are led by the Spirit right now. Don't you dare shut them up. You know, there was a time when the disciples also were praising him. And, and, uh, (laughs) and of course, the religious leaders of the day got mad. And told him that you need to silence your disciples. He said, if they stop, then the rocks are going to break protocol. (laughs) Folks, we have to understand that when you live a life of thankfulness, we are not to allow ourselves to fall into a religious pattern that would silence our praise or our thankfulness. How sad is it when people begin to talk about church and church functions and all that can come out of them is negative? We wonder. We wonder why it is that we're not reaching our culture. I can tell you. It's because the churches have started singing songs and gave up their praise. I'm just going to let that statement settle in. Churches started singing songs and gave up their praise. They gave up a life of thankfulness. God himself was extravagant and sent his son Jesus the word, and we can't even fully understand what kind of protocol that broke. God in flesh, Emmanuel, God with us, still changing lives today. Amen? In closing, I know I've already talked too long, but hey, you gave a lot of grace to Pastor Mark last week, and he preached a long, stinking time. (laughs) 
which I'm grateful for. <laughs> Do love and appreciate them. Turn with me, if you will, into Psalm 30. And we're just going to read through this psalm in closing, and we're going to pray and leave. Psalm 30. As you turn there, it's a little tidbit. This is awesome. Psalm 30, a psalm for the dedication of the temple, and it was a psalm of David. Here, let that sink in for a second. Some of you understand why that's awesome. Some of you don't understand. I'll explain it to you. King David had it in his heart to build the temple, but the Lord told him no. <laughs> he loved God so much, he wanted to build him a place. And he says, the Lord looks at him and he says, no, you've got too much blood on your hands. You're not going to build me a temple, but your son will. And throughout the scripture, you read through First and Second Chronicles, you read through First and Second Kings, and there's a lot of hints there where David would do awesome things for God and he would bring the plunder in and he would, he would prepare for Solomon to build the temple. Before Solomon ever became king, he was, he was storing and preparing what was necessary for Solomon to build the temple. David said, okay, I can't build it myself, but I can sure make sure it gets done and I can do my part. And I love this. This is a psalm that's prepared for the dedication of the temple, a temple that David never saw in his, with his fleshly eyes. But he prepared it. He prepared his son to give thanks for something that David would never see. Hear what I just said? Parents in the room, we need to equip our children to be able to give thanks for things that we'll never see. We need, to, we need to store up and instill in them the ability to be thankful. The ability to return to the source. The ability to declare what God has done. Have you shared with your children and grandchildren what God has done in your life? If you have not, I encourage you to do so today. And if you uh, say, I just don't know if I remember, start. I encourage you to start making a, 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 a document. Put it on a computer, start writing it in a, in a notebook or something. Write down the testimonies of your family so that your children have something to stir their faith and to be grateful for. Amen? Let's look what David says here in the Psalm 30. I will exalt you, O Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. You know, I'd like to give a one in ten praise today. The kind of praise that says, others may not respond to this, but I will because it fits me. And I'm going to ask you to do something that's, that's going to break protocol. Okay? I'm not going to ask you to yell and shout and dance. If you feel like that's what you need to do, so be it. I'm not going to stop you. As long as it's for the Lord and not for your attention. I don't care. But if this fits your life, I want to ask you to stand up and lift your hands and just say thank you. And then we're done. You can sit back down. I'm going to stand here the whole time because I fit all of these. But, and I'm the pastor and I have to be up here. So, And I realized earlier, if I sit down, you can't see me. Psalm 30, verse 1. I will exalt you, O Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. If you, for any reason, have ever had some kind of victory in God, and He's given that to you in your life, would you just stand and give Him a praise? Just lift your hands and say thank you. For this one, it was a disease. For this one, it was a disease. For others, it may be other things, a work situation, a home situation. Father, we just thank you. We thank you for the victories that you've brought in our lives. Things that we've seen, things that we don't even see regularly, God. We don't understand it. But Father, we want to be the one that returns to you and falls at your feet and says, thank you. Father, we just thank you. We glorify you. Birth in us a heart of gratefulness for the things that you have done in our lives. Verse 2, he says, Oh Lord my God, I called to you for help and you healed me. If you've ever been healed by God for anything, just lift your hands and your voice and just begin to thank Him. Father, we thank you for your healing touch. Lord, some of us, some of us are healed and we don't even know it yet. We're like these, these lepers who were told to go our way and as they do, they turn away and on their way they're healed. Father, I pray for the needs that were brought to you this morning that these individuals as they go their way, they will be healed on their way. And Father, I thank you for my healing. I thank you for the healings in my family. Lord, I thank you that at 15 years old when my appendix burst and the poison should have been into my bloodstream and caused problems, even death, I thank you that you contained it into a pocket 
of your grace and I was healed. I thank you, Father, for the healing of my daughter. Thank you, God, for the touch of your hand on the lives of my family members. The psalmist says this also, you brought me out of, up from the grave. You spared me from going down into the pit. How many of you were on a pathway of destruction? <laughs> How many of you were like me and literally on the highway to hell? The only difference was I was singing it on the pathway. <laughs> Proud of it. Folks, listen. Aren't you glad that God loved you enough to reach in and to pull you out of that nonsense and to set you on your feet and say, I love you, I forgive you, here's mercy, here's grace, here's my spirit, I seal you with a promise of things to come as a deposit. Go your way, go healed, go saved, go set free. Father, I thank you for salvation. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. Oh, if you can't thank Him for anything else, surely you can thank Him for the blood of Jesus. Surely you can thank Him for the sanctification of your life, of being set free from the path of sin and death. Father, we want to be a grateful church. A church full of thanks. Verses 4 through 12 says, Sing to the Lord, you saints of His. Praise His holy name. For His anger lasts only a moment, but His favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may remain for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. When I felt secure, I said, I shall never be shaken. O oh Lord, when you favored me, you made my mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, O oh Lord, I called. To the Lord, I cried for mercy. What gain is there in my destruction, in my going down into the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, O oh Lord, and be merciful to me. O oh Lord, be my help. You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy that my heart may sing to you and not be silent. Oh, Lord, my God, I will give you thanks forever. Amen. Hallelujah. Have you ever experienced the favor of God upon your life? <laughs> give Him thanks. Father, I thank You for Your favor. And the times that I went off track, the times that I missed it, the times that I was discouraged, the times that I was misled, your favor didn't withdraw itself from me. I too had to come to the realization that you called me to preach, you called me, Lord, to praise, you called me to do these things, and I can't do it if I'm in the dust of the earth. Why would you destroy me when you have called me to do other things? I thank you for your favor. I thank you for your deliverance. And God, I will thank you and I will praise you forever. Father, it's happening now. It's going to happen tomorrow. It's going to happen to the next day and the day after that and the week after that until I stand in your presence and it's not going to stop then. I'm going to keep on praising you. I'm going to keep on thanking you, Father. And I pray that that thankfulness will overflow out of my heart into the lives of those that are around me. Thank you, God, for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you, God. Let me live a life of gratitude as we consider the source of every good thing in our lives today. We praise you together. We thank you together. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Are you thankful? Can you live thankful? <laughs> we don't deserve it. We don't deserve any of it. But he's good. And his mercy endures forever. Praise you, Father. If you just want to receive a blessing today, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. He turn His face towards you, His countenance towards you. A peaceful countenance that will give you peace. Father, we impart your name upon us today that we would go and do your will in the power of your Holy Spirit this week. In Jesus' holy name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Now you can hug necks and greet people on your way out. You are dismissed.